Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. This is going to be part 18 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. This book is about 100 years old. This is part two of the book, chapter seven. Chapter seven of part two, page 207. The title of this chapter is The Prince of the Scarlet Thread and the Royal Remnant United. So let's get reading. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've read this book. Boy. And uh, by the way, um, hopefully I'll have some more time to do more Bible studies because um, I'm going to be working four days a week, four 10-hour days. And uh, it's, that's a lot better than working uh, six days a week, you know, five, eight, five eight-hour days in a day of overtime. So hopefully I'll have some more time. Plus uh, changing the hours so I don't have to fight uh, traffic in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, it's traffic in Palm Beach County is horrible. It's like what Miami was in the 70s. Which is why we moved up here. One of the reasons. To get away from all the crazy people in Miami. Which, uh, yeah. Okay, let's read the book. In connection with the record of the fact that the high or ruling prince of Judah had been uncrowned and dethroned and that the low had been crowned and placed on the throne, we find that a royal prince, a royal princess, and the ten-tribed kingdom of Israel are all together in the same country. Also that this royal pair are united and placed on a throne and are ruling over the kingdom of Israel. These facts are recorded in the 17th chapter of Ezekiel in the form of a riddle and a parable which together with their explanation make up the subject matter of the entire chapter which opens as follows. All right, so uh, the book doesn't do this but I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the entire um, 17th chapter of Ezekiel so all right Ezekiel 17 verse 1 and uh, yeah if you want to read a really wild book in the Bible Ezekiel is it yeah and the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man Put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors, many colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. Bob's note here. I actually did a Bible study on eagle's wings. If you look at Revelation, I think it's chapter 12, it says that God takes the woman, the church, Israel, uh, by the wings of a great eagle, if I remember correctly, I, I gotta look that up, and takes her into the wilderness. You know, the Bible is full of symbolism, and the symbolism will explain itself. Yeah, that is in um, Revelation 12 and verse 14. 
I did an, a commentary on Revelation chapter 12, very important chapter of the Bible Re and Revelation. Uh, Revelation 12, 14, and to the woman, the church, which is Israel, and to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a year, and times, two years, and half a time from the face of the serpent. This is talking about the tribulation period. A time is a year, and times is two years and half a time. So for roughly three and a half years, 42 months, uh, I think it's 1260 days or 1290 days, I forget. Um, the Bible uses all three dating methods, days, months, and years. Uh, to describe what the Great Tribulation is going to be, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it's basically going to be hell on earth, basically, for those who are of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, Christians, and yeah, you get the idea. Um So let's take a look. Uh, now take a look at the book of Exodus real quick. Exodus 19. Um, this is when Israel was taken out of captivity, the Egyptian captivity by Moses. You know, the first Passover. And, you know, they hightailed it out of Egypt. Well, actually the Egyptians... <laughs> told him to leave, you know, <laughs> after the uh, Passover, all the firstborn of Egypt were killed. So let's read Exodus 19.1. Now, I, like I say, I did a Bible study on eagle's wings. I cover this aspect very, um, well, I should say a, a bit more thoroughly than what I'm doing here. But um, verse one, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Look at the first three letters of Sinai. S-I-N-A-I. Sin, A-I. Artificial intelligence, eh, I don't know. For they were departed from Rephidim, and they came to the desert of Sinai, and it pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah, the, all the firstborn died. They had the plague of frogs. They had the plague of, uh, I think, lice, flies, frogs. Um, they had the hail that, that, you know, the locusts. I mean, Egypt was just about destroyed. I mean, yeah. So... Ye have seen, oh, and it and it matches, on, oh, by the way, I did a Bible study on the plagues of Egypt, contrasted, compared and contrasted with the plagues of Revelation. There's a lot of similarities there, people. You know, you want to know the future, look to the past. As far as the Bible's concerned, you know. You're not going to learn anything of listening to TBN and Sid Roth. It's supernatural. Yeah, their Messiah is coming, but their Messiah is not our Messiah. So, and Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus thou shalt say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings. Did the Lord bring this huge eagle that flew down and took 
all the Israelites and put it on their wings and fly away? No, it's a figure of speech, people. It's a figure of speech. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. I think it's in the book of Peter. He uses this exact same language. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And in Revelation 12, you know, the woman, the church, Israel, is given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Well, where did Israel go when they left Egypt? Into the wilderness, the wilderness of Sinai. It even says that in verse 1 here, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. Yeah, I just read Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1 through uh, 6. Eagle's wings, people. Did a Bible study on it. So, all right. I guess we should read Ezekiel 17. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord, God. Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. Oh boy. Um, like I told everybody, I did an entire uh, commentary on the book of Ezekiel. I did one on the book of Isaiah and on Jeremiah. Jeremiah was not my favorite book, trust me. But um, in Ezekiel 31, when they're talking about the cedars of Lebanon, it's very interesting. So let's take a look at uh, Ezekiel 31 before we go back to Ezekiel 17. You know, I've, I, I, I can't remember ever, go, when I used to go to the so-called the 501c3 churches, they never read this stuff, never. I've never heard anybody read this stuff. Um, the Church of Israel in Missouri, they're about the only one that I know of. You know, so they don't want us to know this stuff, I guess. Or maybe they don't understand it themselves. I don't know. But uh, let's read Ezekiel 31. Well, we're going to read about half the chapter. All right, let's read Ezekiel 31. Verse 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man. Isn't that what Jesus called himself all the time? Oh, yeah. Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. What is a cedar? It's a type of tree. They take cedar chips and put them into closets because moths do not like the smell of cedar. And, uh, you know, moths will uh, lay eggs in your wool clothing and eat the wool. And you'll have holes in your clothing. So they take cedar. Uh, from what I understand, termites will not eat cedar. It has a very strong smell. And cedar does not rot. Gee, Bob, how do you know so much about cedar? Oh, well, they grow it down here in Florida. Well, it grows down here in Florida. Yeah. It's got a very strong smell. So, so here it is. The Lord is 
comparing the Assyrians to a tree, figure of speech. Who were the Assyrians? The Assyrians were the ones that took the northern Israel into captivity. You know, uh, you know, guys, we we know, you know, like on a football game, you got to know who the players are, right? You got the red team and the blue team or whatever, you know, or um, that's why people, um, when they don't know who the players are, the game doesn't make any sense. Well, the Bible is the same way. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. Now remember, Ezekiel 17 talks about a cedar also. Taking a branch from the cedar. There's a reason why I'm reading all this. You know, I'm just not jabbering to take up time so I can post another hour study. You know. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature and his top was among the thick boughs. So the the tree, the shroud, the you know, the branches and the leaves were were put out a lot of shadow. And it was high. It was, you know, a very tall tree, and its top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. You know, the Bible says that um, waters, when the beast of Revelation comes up out of the waters, you know, the stupid Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a picture there of a seven-headed beast coming up out of the sea, out of the out of the ocean you know it's just like when you when they they have a picture of naked adam and eve and there's a snake hanging from this apple tree and 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 eve's taking a bite out of this apple that's the kind of nonsense that's why i always tell people don't buy study bibles especially you know they got pictures in them because you that that picture is burned in your mind and then they you know that's the stupidity but what are the waters the Bible tells you what the waters are all right the interpretation to the waters is found in Revelation 17 and 15 talking about the whore you know of Revelation and he said unto me, The waters, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Revelation 17, 15. Sometimes when the waters, Bible's talking about waters, it's talking about people, uh, you know, a sea of humanity or whatever. Other times it's talking about a liquid called H2O, dihydrogen oxide. So, you know, it's uh, figures of speech. And uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses will have a picture of this monster coming out of the sea. And that's what they're thinking about. But they never tell them that the waters where the beast comes out of is our people. Boy, I'll tell you what, the Jehovah's Witnesses, boy, what a what a group. I studied a little bit under them in the 70s when they said, oh, the world's going to end in 1975-76. Jesus is going to come back and put this wicked system under his feet. <clears throat> um still waiting still waiting so yeah they're they're false prophets so people are stupid anybody that would stay with with a, a group that's a false prophet deserves what they get so 
Back to Ezekiel 31, verse 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters, the waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. So how are great nations going to dwell under the shadow of a tree? Figure of speech, people. Verse 7. Thus he was fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen to this carefully. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Verse 9. Carefully listen. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Do trees have emotions? Envy? You know? Uh, have you ever noticed a, a girl looking at a, another beautiful woman and having and envying her beauty because all the guys are, uh, you know, flocking all over her? Yeah, envy. Trees don't have emotions. This is a figure of speech. And I did it a, an entire thing on Ezekiel 31. It's a very, very interesting chapter. You know, and that's another thing. Doesn't that prove that there were other groups of people in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? Adam is a racial description. You know, were there other people in the Garden of Eden? Ezekiel 31 seems to prove there was, you know. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 17. We'll start at the beginning again. Uh, and the word of the, of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon, and took the highest branch of the cedar. Hmm, you know, you know, there's a lot of symbolism in this. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. You know, people read this stuff and they say, oh, I just don't understand the Bible. Well, read James chapter 1 where the Lord says, you know, James says to ask the Lord for understanding. And you can't read just 
the, the New Testament and think you're going to understand anything. The Bible's in, a, in an entire book. So, he took also the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose low stature, whose branches were turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. Um, didn't Jesus say, um, what did Jesus say? I had to get this right. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Oh, yeah. The Bible likens Israel to uh, the vine, you know, like a grapevine. So, uh, do, 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 do. verse 6. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low statures, stature, whose branches were turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches and that it might bear fruit, bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Say thou, thus saith the Lord, God, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof that it wither? It shall wither and all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utter, utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Moreover, the word of the Lord God came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house. Who's the rebellious house? Israel. Northern Israel. And Judah. Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them. Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and hath taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath, an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be base, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand. All right, so um, Jeremiah had warned the king of, you know, Judah and Jerusalem that uh, judgment was coming in the form of Babylon. But instead of them repenting and following the Lord and turning back to the Lord, he, uh, well, let's read what happens here. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doeth such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? So instead of the king of Israel or of Judah trusting in the Lord, he trusted in Egypt. And Babylon <laughs> crushed Egyptian, the Egyptian army, just absolutely crushed it. You know, when you've got the Lord against you, you, you got a problem. Yeah. So, 
So uh, the king of Judah had, uh, I guess you could say he PO'd the Lord just a little bit too often. Verse 16. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth, that made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he brake, even with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he, the king of Judah, despised the oath by breaking the covenant when lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he had broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him and he shall be taken in my snare, you know, a trap. And I will bring him to Babylon and will plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed against me. Yes, the king of Judah trespassed against the Lord. Verse 21. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, hath spoken it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop it off from the top of his young twigs, a tender one, a tender one. Wouldn't a princess be a tender one? Oh, yeah. A tender one and will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a godly, uh, I'm sorry, a goodly cedar and under it shall dwell all fowls of every wing and the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree and dried up the green tree and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. And that is the end of Ezekiel chapter 17. Oh boy, let's go back to reading this book. So, the book says, These facts are recorded in the 17th chapter of Ezekiel in the form of a riddle and a parable, which together with their explanation make up the subject matter of the entire chapter, which opens as follows. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, etc. The Hebrew word, which is here translated riddle, is defined as a puzzle, hence a trick, conundrum, dark saying, hard question, etc., etc. These definitions correspond to our English thought of an enigma or something proposed which is to be solved by conjecture, a puzzling question or an ambiguous proposition. A parable, on the other hand, is more like a fable or an allegorical representation of something which is real in its relation to human life and thought and is represented by something real in nature. Bob's note here. Remember that Jesus spoke in parables because he wanted to hide the meaning from the multitudes. What? But Chaplain Bob, Jesus came to, 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 to bring light to the earth, not to hide things. Oh, yeah? Is that what Billy Goat Graham taught us? In Matthew 13, in verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You know, why, why are you doing this? He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know, it is given unto you 
to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And you could read the rest of this, and, you know, it just tells you know, verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. The Lord blinds their eyes. There's a whole lot of church people whose eyes are blinded because they do things that are totally displeasing unto the Lord. And trust me, I'm not saying that I understand this stuff because I'm pleasing to the Lord. No, I got a lot of things in my life that are not pleasing to the Lord. But uh, yeah, what can I tell you? All right, so... Verse, uh, page 208, thus the prophet in his introduction prepares us to expect that the words which follow shall be enigma, en, enigmatic, enigmatical. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, two years of college didn't do me much good, did it? What is an enigma? It's a noun. Uh... A dark saying in which some known thing is concealed using obscure language. An obscure question, a riddle, a question, saying or painting containing a hidden meaning which is proposed to be guessed. Sounds like Freemasonry to me. All right, let's, uh, let's keep reading. Um, and since the Lord commanded him to use this veiled language you know, Ezekiel. We must adjust ourselves accordingly, remembering that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. And I believe that's in, um, that is an actual quote from the Bible, by the way. I believe it's in the Proverbs. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up, but just, just so you know, it's in the Bible. The Lord wants us to search out his word, to dig, to study. You know, people don't do that, most. Very, very few. So then, let us, in a spirit that shall be worthy of kings, search out the matter of this riddle, which we will notice is put forth unto the house of Israel, and not to the uh, people of Judah. The first part of the riddle is given as follows. Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried, carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. A few moments reflection will convince us that whatever else it may mean, the great eagle is intended to represent a means of transportation for the declaration is that it came to a certain place and took something which is in that place to which it came and carried it into some other land we are also told that this means of transportation came to Lebanon since Lebanon is a mountain range in Palestine then the place to which it came and from it departed is most certainly most certainly Palestine that which was taken away is declared to be young twigs which were taken from the highest branch of the cedar of Lebanon since the personal pronoun his is used having the cedar for its uh, antecedent antecedent what boy this guy must have been really educated. All right, according to Webster's 1828, uh, it means going before in time prior, proceeding as an event, uh, antecedent to the deluge. You know, like, I guess, like Noah was told, uh, there's going to be a flood coming, build an ark. 
so I guess it's the Lord declaring something as having happened already when it has yet to occur. Now that's basically prophecy. I hope I'm reading, understanding this right. All right, so uh, it must represent a person. This person is of the masculine gender and father of the young twigs, hence these young scions are also persons. Furthermore, it is well documented, oh, it is a well authenticated fact that the cedar of Lebanon is a symbol of royalty. Since the riddle contains within itself such abundant evidence of this fact, which will be made clear as we proceed, we will not need to go any uh, need to go elsewhere for proof. Again, inasmuch as it is true of twigs that they must be set, grafted, or planted in order that they may grow and bear fruit or increase, so also it is declared of these young royal scions that they were set. The place also where they were set was certainly well adopted for increase of population or subjects that is, a city of merchants in a land of traffic. The second part of the riddle reads as follows. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and shot forth sprigs. The seed of the land is most certainly the people of the land, the land from which he took this seed or people is Palestine, and the people of Palestine are distinctively Israelites, and numerically hence, preeminently, they are always the ten-tribed kingdom of Israel. So these people who had been taken out of their own land were planted in another land, and that other has become to them a fruitful field, which is located by great waters, not by the Mediterranean Sea or the Great Sea, as it is called in scripture, but the new home of this removed people is by great waters. Um, Bob's note here, this could have a double meaning. So great waters could be people, or how about the Atlantic Ocean? I don't know. Take a look. In their new home, Israel grew and became a spreading vine. And since this riddle is dealing with the branch, as we shall see, in which the high and the low princes of the royal house are to exchange places, we are not surprised that the spreading or outreaching vine is said to be of low stature, nor that its branches and sprigs turned toward him, or that its roots or growing power was under him. If under him, then he was over them, i.e. their ruler. This ruler further states, further says, uh, there was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him, and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, and that it might be a goodly vine. Here we have the record of the arrival of another passenger, who also came to the land of good soil, which is by the great waters, and who was brought there by the same means of transportation, i.e. a great eagle with great wings, as that which brought the royal sons. This was not the same eagle, but another eagle or ship, for we believe this means of transportation to have been the ships of Dan, the ships of Dan, since it is declared that Dan abode in ships. Bob's note here. Guess what, people? Um, have you ever heard of Denmark? 
and the Vikings, you know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Vikings, what did they, how did they travel? Long ships. I mean, there's evidence. Uh, they not only went to Iceland, they went to Greenland, which is off the coast of Canada. And there's evidence that the um, Vikings came to America and had battles with the Indians. Of course, you know, you're talking an entire tribe of Indians against a couple of, you know, ships of Vikings. Um, you know, the Vikings would have been totally outnumbered, but but do you know how they spell Denmark? Uh, Denmark? We spell it D-E-N-M-A-R-K. You know how they spell it? D-A-N Mark, M-A-R-K. The Mark of Dan. They call themselves the Danish. D-A-N as the same spelling as the tribe of Dan. Do you know what I-S-H means in Hebrew? Ish? It means man. So Danish or Danish means man of Dan or Dan man. You ever heard of the British? Do you know what Brit means in Hebrew? B-R-I-T? Means covenant. Brit-ish. British covenant man. Boy, they don't teach you this stuff in um, Sunday school, do they? No. What did the British give us? Uh, the King James Bible in the English language. That old book. It's over 400 years old that they're trying to get rid of. Yeah. I think I'm going to stick with the King... King James, any modern Bible, uh, well, any modern Bible using so-called church, as somebody aptly pointed out, like Calvary Chapel with their rock and roll music and their laser light shows, um, using God only knows what, the NIV or whatever. I think I'm going to avoid those places. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to avoid those places. I'm going to stick with the Bible that they hate, the King James. The Geneva is okay, too. So, Oh, you're one of those King James Bible-only people, cult people? Yeah, baby. You're right. I am. Well, I like the Geneva, too. So I guess I'm not King James only, so. Oh, and by the way, did you know that the, um, the, Catholic, the Vatican Manuscripts um, they don't even have one of the manuscripts does not even have the entire book doesn't even have the book of Revelation in it yeah and they call those the oldest and best manuscripts uh, no they did carbon dating which I'm not real fond of on some Greek manuscripts and they were older than the uh, Vatican's manuscripts so all right uh, this was not the same eagle, but another eagle or ship, for we believe this means of transportation to have been the ships of Dan, since it is declared that Dan abode in ships, and I think that's in uh, Genesis, and that they may have taken cedars from Lebanon to make mass for their ships. You know, when you got a sailboat, you need a strong tree to make a mast for your sails and the cedars would not rot in water and yeah it, it was you know, yeah and the cedars of lebanon were very very famous they were very tall strong trees so we also know that the seaport of tyre in palestine was the port into which they must come for the cedars of lebanon Yes, for the cedars of Lebanon, be they used as masts for their ships or as types of their royal princesses, uh, princes. The tribe of Dan also used the eagle as their standard. And they are said to have used great carved eagles with outstretched, outstretched wings as the figureheads on the bows of their 
vessels. I got to look something up here real quick. I couldn't, I had to look it up, but the uh, Viking ships would, um, on the front of their ship, would put a carving, you know, the, the very front of the ship, uh, of a, uh, like a dragon or a serpent. Yeah, so they put a carving, you know. Um, so when you saw the ship coming, that's what you saw. You saw a, um, like a serpent or, you know, a dragon. So what was, uh, what was the tribe of Dan called in the Bible? Ah, uh, it took me a little while to find it. Genesis 49 and verse 17. The Bible says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path. Uh, have you ever heard of a puff adder? It's one of the most deadly snakes you could ever be bitten by. I mean, <laughs> that's what they call it, a death adder. A death adder, because you get bitten by a an adder, deaf adder, you're, yeah, you get the idea. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. Yeah. What did those Vikings put on their ships? Um, yeah, you get the idea. All right, so let's get keep reading this book. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, da, 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 da. The tribe of Dan also used the eagle as their standard and are said to have used great carved eagles with outstretched wings as the figurehead on the bows of their vessels. Uh, the bow is the front of the vessel. I forgot about that. Sorry, I was in the army, not the navy. Um, also, it is a common thing to symbolize ships which are under full sail as flying birds. And in this riddle, the long wings represent the long sails, which like wings carry the great ship, the large bird or eagle ship and her passengers to the land of traffic. We are forced to the conclusion that the object which the writer has in view in mentioning the coming of the second ship is that we may guess that another important personage has arrived for after mentioning that the ship's arrival the next expression is, behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him. Her. You know, the first they were talking about him. Now they're talking about her. Thus, we learn that the person who came in the second ship was a woman and that her inclination and desire was toward the prince who had preceded her into the same land. Then under the similitude of a vine, and that which is essential to its life and growth, viz. land and water, there follows that which clearly indicates a unity of life, claims, and purpose. In fact, there was a marriage between the her and the him of this riddle, the result of which was that she too was set or planted in the land of a goodly vine, albeit that goodly vine is of low stature and bore fruit, that is, offspring. A lot of times the Bible talks about fruit. It's talking about children. The fruit of the womb. Not fruit of the loom, the, the underwear company that ran off to China and destroyed a town in Kentucky uh, because they were like the, one of the sole employers. Just closed up shop and moved. Uh, yeah, the you-know-whos. Since it is true that a prince can wed only with a princess, it will be well for us at this juncture to remember that we left Jeremiah and his little royal remnant of king's daughters on their way to a land which was strange or unknown to them, yet to a place where this preserved seed of David's line was to be planted again, take root, and bear fruit. Now, it is a fact that the man and the woman of this riddle were united. 
Also, it is a fact that the woman was planted in the land of good soil into which she did take root, and these things were accomplished in order that she might bear fruit. In other words, that which hitherto had been the subject of a prophecy concerning Jeremiah's commission and concerning his royal charge is now recorded as a matter of history. The analogy is complete. Still, the expression uh, the explanation, still the explanation of this riddle makes all these things so plain that we are not left to conjecture. For as the 11th verse, the prophet says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, The king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them to Babylon. The king of Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar, as we know. The king of Jerusalem and the princes thereof were, as we know, Zedekiah and his sons. Then follows a brief account of Zedekiah's treachery with the king of Babylon, how he rebelled against him and sent to the king of Egypt for help. Bob's note here, that's an entire study of itself. Um, Nebuchadnezzar had, uh, Zedekiah had pledged his loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar, but then, if I remember correctly, uh, don't quote me on this, but, but then he tried to get Egypt to help him uh, fight Nebuchadnezzar. So, and uh, the king of Babylon didn't take kindly to that, so. So he sent to the king of Egypt for help. Then comes a prophecy concerning the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar shall die in Babylon. After this comes the prophetic account of that band of fugitives going to Egypt and the declaration that they should fall by the sword, etc., all of which we have given in detail. But the outcome of it all and that which pertains to our immediate subject begins again with the 22nd verse. The prophet, still using the symbols of the riddle, explains as follows. Thus saith the Lord God, I will take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. This is the royal prince who came in ship number one, then proceeds to say, I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. eminent. This is the second importation of royal branches, but this time... It is the top or one whose right it is to rule a tender one. That is, it is a tender young girl, the topmost one of the young twigs that came in ship number two. Where was she planted? In the mountains of the heights of Israel? Is the divine reply, what Israel? Yes, Israel, national Israel. Israel as a nation but not Judah Israel, for that kingdom is overthrown. The people are gone into the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. The king, with his eyes put out, King Nebuchadnezzar put out the eyes of uh, Zedekiah. Yeah, made him blind. Uh, and is doomed to die in chains in a Babylon, Babylon prison the princes are dead, the king's daughters have escaped out of Jerusalem, and the topmost one of these tender twigs is planted here in the height of the mountains of Israel, i.e. the throne. Bob's note here. Remember, God promised King David he would always have a man on the throne of Israel. But the modern church world says, well, no, God lied. He broke his promise. There's no, there's no king of Israel uh, of the David line anywhere in the world. So God's a liar. God's a liar, they'll tell you. I disagree with them, but uh, hey, I'm just a guy that reads the Bible every once in a while. So, you know, what do I know? And it, that which was planted, shall bring forth boughs and her fruits 
and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. In the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. The purpose of this is so glaringly plain that the most obtuse mind can see that it refers to the mixed population which Israel of necessity must have gathered while being sifted through other countries. The prophet further declares, and all the trees of the field, i.e. all the people of that kingdom of Israel, shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. Ezekiel 17, 24. Done what? Brought down the high from the throne and exalted the low to the throne. What else? Made the long foretold breach, remembering his covenant with David and kept faith with Jeremiah. See, the Lord remembers and keeps his covenants. Um, there are two different types of covenants. There are conditional covenants which is like a contract. You do this, I'll do that. Hey, I got a used car for sale here. You give me $3,500 cash, it's yours. You don't give me the money, car's mine, stays mine. But you give me the money, the car's yours, you know? Or you paint my house, I'll pay you $1,000. Yeah, that's a contract, that's a covenant. You, you know, that's a conditional, a conditional covenant. And then you have an unconditional covenant where God says, I will do this. You don't have to do anything. King David had a unconditional covenant that a man of his line, of his seed, his children, would rule and reign on the throne of Israel forever. So either the church world so-called lost this information or God lied. And I don't, I know God doesn't lie. So I know it's the so-called church world. Of course, the Vatican will tell you that the Pope, uh, he's the, yeah, they, they want you to think he's the, uh, of the, you know, the ruler in place of, yeah, I don't think so. So, all right, uh, what else? Made the long foretold breach, remembered his covenant with David, and kept faith with Jeremiah. For since these trees are the royal cedars, and the male heirs of the former reigning line have been dethroned in favor of him that was low, who also is the spreading vine of low stature of the riddle, and who is now exalted by being enthroned, and since a royal princess found her way to the land of the vine of low stature and united her interests with his that he might water the furrows of her plantation. We are safe in saying that God has taken the crown from off the head of Zedekiah, the high, who was of the Pharaoh's line and had placed it on the head of a prince of Zerah, the, the low to whom Zedekiah's daughter the heir to crown and scepter made her way in company with Jeremiah, who had charge of the royal paraphernalia and who was divinely commissioned to plant and build anew the plucked up and overthrown kingdom of David. By the way, people, I cover this thing about uh, Zerah and Pharez. Pharez? Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, Pharaohs and Zerah, uh, in a previous study, I don't remember what part it was, but if you go back one or two uh, parts, I think it's part 17 or 16, I'm not sure. But if you go back one or two parts from this, you'll cover that, where Tamar uh, pretended to be a prostitute and got her father-in-law to uh, give her children, yeah. And she was a pure-blooded Israelite of Judah and 
So was Judah. So, yeah. Yeah, God bypassed the Canaanite children of uh, Judah. And by the way, um, think about this. The Canaanite child of Judah, what do you think he's going to call himself? A Canaanite? No, he's going to call himself... Uh, what is the slang for Judah? Um, yeah, it starts with a J. Yeah, and uh, it rhymes with uh, the uh, like news papers. Yeah, you get the idea. All right, uh, Christ came through the family line of Judah, David, Josiah, and Jeconiah, not through the not through the breach. The breach ran through Judah, David, Josiah, and Zedekiah. So the two branches of the Judah, Pharaoh's David line diverge as Josiah, at Josiah. Now remember people, Josiah was a great king. He got rid of the evildoers. Got rid of them. Yeah, you should read about King Josiah. I think I did a Bible study on Josiah. I greatly admire the guy. I mean, he did. He 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 got rid of the evil lures. And I don't mean he bought them a Greyhound bus ticket so they could go home, go somewhere else. No, he got rid of them. One of these lines eventually gave birth to the Messiah, as we shall prove. The other line, after having been united to the brother line of the scarlet thread, are still holding that preserved throne and scepter and raising up seed unto their fathers, Judah and David, so that there will never be a lack of someone of David's children to sit upon that throne as rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the scepter may not depart from Judah till Shiloh come. And that's in the book of Genesis. That the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh come. Shiloh, they, that's how we pronounce it. The you know who's pronounce it as Shalom, which means peace. You know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem means city of peace. Shalom means peace. Shiloh means peace. Who is Shiloh? The scepter may not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Who's the Prince of Peace? Jesus. Thus it is that one of these lines holds that scepter and wears the crown as a fact, but the uh, Judah David line has a greater son to whom they belong by right. When he comes as Shiloh, God will give it to him, for unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. At the time, the breaches will be healed, and he shall be called the restorer of the breach. And it's talking about the, the children that came out of Tamar, the the Pharaohs and um, Pharaohs and uh, yeah. Um, the question now is to find where the scepter and throne are today. Yeah, where is the throne and scepter today? Where are they? For we are not only confronted with the question of lost Israel or the lost birthright, which involves the whole house of Joseph and the many nations into which they were to develop, but we are also confronted with the question of the lost scepter, which involves the Zedekiah branch of the house of David and all its uh, heraldic blazonry. Uh, have you ever heard of her heraldry? You're talking about uh, the artwork. You know, you look at the great seal of the United States, it's an eagle. Uh, that's heraldry. Um, the presidential seal, heraldry. You look at the um, England, uh, they've got the lion, they've got the um, unicorn. Um, that's heraldry. So, yeah, you could take a look at all that. So, uh, all right. Well, this is the end of the chapter, and uh, the next um, the next Bible study will be on part three of this book. Part three.
and um, chapter one. So I forgot how good this book really was. I really did. Uh, it's been, like I told you in the beginning, it'd been probably 30 some odd years since I'd read this book. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been a believer for about half my life now. So, uh, yeah. Get yourself the uh, King James Bible on, on uh, MP3 or CD and listen to, the, listen to it on the way to work. Or when you're traveling, you know, instead of devil music. Sometimes I need to take my own advice, but uh, yeah. All right, everybody. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son. Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. The King of kings and Lord of lords. The name that casts out devils. The name that they want to get rid of. Amen.